What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we're bringing you Block Digest number 195 uh, on Wednesday, October 23rd at block height 600,734. So, uh, what's going on? Uh, no par and Janine. Uh, uh, how, how is the, uh, the week of everybody traveling? Well, my voice sounds pretty bad, but not as bad as it was two mornings ago when I couldn't talk at all, so... You'll have to deal with this for the rest of the episode. I, I don't believe you. Um, I, I've been told you, you're just using a voice shifter to, to throw off the intelligence services. That's that's basically what people kept telling me, but I really couldn't talk. So this is as good as it's going to get right now. Mm, no, Para, how, how's shit with you uh, in, in the real China? <laughs> Yeah, you could say that. Uh, I'm in Taiwan right now, and uh, yeah, that was China before the communists took over, and China people uh, went flew to Taiwan. Uh, anyway, quick history lesson. So I'm set to report another topic that I had to remove rescue time because I was looking at what it's logging, and I really wasn't comfortable with that. <laughs> Anyway, and finally, just to kick in the show, I want to share you a quick story about the Transylvanian Crypto Conference. At one night, Peter Todd, Giacomo Zucco, and Mir BTC uh, get in a taxi with me, and we went to a place. But in the taxi, I brought up it was Friday night. People were drunk, and in the taxi, I brought up quantum computers. And Giacomo and Peter Todd just all hell break loose. They started to to argue about what what they think. <laughs> I think, <laughs> and I had no 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 voice. It just it just went for that like ten minutes, and at the end. The taxi driver couldn't keep his laughing <laughs> himself. Started laughing so hard. It was so funny that what the fuck is going on in Friday? <laughs> He's used to drunk people, <laughs> not people talking about quantum computers and stuff. Uh, anyway. Conference arguments are the best. <laughs> yeah, so let's go on and talk about a bit Electrum and Lightning. I have some information. Yeah, I think yeah, this this is uh oh, I think first two stories will kind of just blur into uh you know beginning banter, but uh you know two two awesome pieces of news I, I saw uh from far away uh, at the Lightning Conference is uh Electrum um has finished their Python um Lightning implementation and that's going to be um released in the next uh, major release of Electrum as well as uh, async. Um, demoed a new wallet. Uh, their their branding is Phoenix, which is going to be the first um, wallet using a trampoline node on the Lightning Network, which is pretty much um, like outsourcing all of the the routing um, to to a more beefy node, so that the your phone doesn't have to deal with that because that's a a point of of user friction. Like it, it's when you're sitting there waiting, waiting, and then the payment's not going through, it's, it's likely because of, you know, your phone being a little taxed having to compute those things. And so, like, that that, that was two fucking awesome announcements, uh, you know, as far as software development really moving forward in the Lightning space. But, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of other stuff uh, you saw <laughs> that didn't really hit my radar, Jimmy. 
Yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, regarding the Electrum stuff, I have some things because I've been very, very much waiting for the Electrum release because it got a court card improvement that I really need. And, uh, and I was... So I thought that Electrum was releasing like every month, even less than every month. But then they stopped releasing since July. They did not release and I didn't know what the heck is going on. So I'm like, okay, opening a GitHub issue. Uh, guys, when is the next release? And they said uh, it's not going to happen anytime soon because the Lightning Network integration is going to be in that and it's it's very much not ready yet so so yeah my point is that it's it's not going to happen next month or something like that unfortunately but 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 it's awesome i mean yeah it's kudos for the electrum guys they are doing really great job yeah mm -hmm. i mean you know when, when i saw that it's like this this is like monumental because like not only is this a uh, you know uh, a, a new implementation of lightning uh, in Python, which I, I'm personally happy about, because that that's pretty much the the extent of my programming knowledge is, is fucking with a, a a very basic amount of Python. And so now I I can go fumble in and try to fuck with things like a retard, but also like this is the first wallet that predated the Lightning Network. Um, that it's going to be integrating Lightning. So, like, that is huge in, in terms of just, like, landmark events in, in Lightning developments moving forward. It's it's not just that, but the Python implementation of the Lightning Network is huge in terms of that it might be the first really, like, well-used language that actually implements the Lightning Network, you know? We have implementations in like C, C++, and I don't even know Rust. <laughs> but Python is something that a lot of developers can actually get involved in. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, yeah, like, you know, like I said, like, I'm not even a programmer. And like, this has brought like that down to the level of accessibility that even I could like try and fuck around and tinker with very basic stuff. And it's like, that's really fucking cool. I'm just waiting for the C sharp implementation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I don't know if your uh, voice is up to it, Janine. I mean, before uh, we move into the next lightning uh, news, is like anything you wanted to talk about uh, as far as the conference out there? Like uh, everything I was seeing looked pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, there there was a ton of awesome stuff going on, um, and I did get to see some people from Electrum. Uh, and they, that was a big thing that they were talking about, obviously, at the conference. Um, yeah, there was a bunch of, a bunch of projects that they're, they're basically at the stage where they're either close to launch or they've already launched something. <laughs> I'm going to get you sick just listening. I'm sorry. Yeah, for anyone who just came in, my voice is awful because I lost it days ago and it hasn't quite come back yet. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of interesting projects going on. I got to see the... Uh, the M&M &M machine again, the dispenser that was uh, displayed to Congress, actually. Um, it's apparently portable because the guy was carrying it around in his backpack and uh, in his backpack pocket. Um, there was also a really cool 3D printer. Um, they were basically making, I think it was called uh, Crypto Cloaks or something like that. And they were making 3D printed cases that you can use to like hide your hardware wallets in. Some of them were more creative, like there was a taco one, but some of them were just really simple that you could attach them to a bottom uh, of your desk or something just to, you know, have a, not a completely foolproof hiding place, but just something really simple. If you're using a hardware wallet often and you want to keep it out of sight, that would be a good idea. So yeah, there was a lot of really cool projects happening there. And um, the Electrum announcement was relatively recent. So, yeah, good good on them. Mm -hmm. I, I actually really like that that Crypto Cloak uh, company. Like one, one of the, the things they have, too, is um, like a little slip case for an open dime. 
And I've always liked the idea of that because even though it's obviously 3D printed, it's like you can try and make an open dime look like just a regular USB stick. And and that's uh, got some interesting possibilities, I think. Alrighty, so uh, I guess let's get into the uh, the FUD. So, okay, can I ask you something, Shinobi? Are you familiar with the recent open, uh, recent quote card drama on uh, Twitter? Um, no, I tend to ignore that because, like, I like honestly, I I don't want to say who's doing it because there's really no definitive evidence, but there is so obviously, like, somebody. Uh, coordinating like trolling campaigns against them that's just constantly bringing up bullshit or like trying to confuse security matters for newbies and it's just so fucking obvious yeah okay let's not get into that um it's still evolving maybe next episode at what's what's going on something about open source and stuff Mm -hmm. but um all right so next up um there was a research paper uh published recently um on a attack on, on the lightning network and you know this is i i don't want to completely downplay this and say that there is zero problem here um it is an issue um that could effectively um grief the the network but i i don't think it's as as serious as people really make it out to be when when you really think about where this is all going to go in the long term so pretty much the idea is that um somebody could just open up a a bunch of channels with well connected nodes and advertise a very low um fee for routing payments and then just not actually um forward the payments so pretty much try to make yourself look like an enticing node to route through and then just like freeze everything and don't pass anything through. And like honestly, like I, I don't really see what the problem is in, in the long term at all. Like like right now, like yes, this is a potential issue, but long term at scale, um, I, I don't buy into the, the the narrative that routing nodes are going to be perfectly decentralized. Uh, I, I very much do think there are going to be core important nodes um, that, that most things are routing through. And I don't think that matters at all because the way everything is onion routed in Lightning, you only know what's ahead of you and behind you in a route. Like you, you don't have any way whatsoever to um, be sure that you are not processing payments for anybody you would want to censor. Um, unless you just completely disconnect from the, the entire Lightning Network. Because if, if, if you won't let this one node open a channel with you because you don't want to interact with it, they can just open up a channel with somebody you're interacting with. And you'll never know if, if payments you're routing are, are for that person that you would like to censor. So I, I really don't think like that this this um denial of service attack is really an issue at scale because like those those nodes that build up and become these important um routing nodes when it comes to liquidity they're they're going to be well known like they they're going to have you know operational times with a very long history and it's going to be really obvious um you know as far as whether you're trying to route through a well um established node like this or just some completely new thing and people will just tend towards using uh trustworthy well-established nodes that aren't pulling this kind of shenanigans and so it's like you know I, it's like right now at this scale very early on like this this could cause a lot of problems and stop payments but really in the long term um like i just a few tweaks to how you actually um decide your route and then just the natural scale that this grows to pretty much address this issue so like i really don't see this as any kind of substantial long-term problem i i agree with that i mean there is a lot of there are a lot of people who are sitting on the sidelines and waiting for lightning network protocol level improvements to get involved that right it's i'm i'm like that too and it's just gonna get more decentralized as we are getting involved in more and more in that and 
you know, I'm not a fan of decentralization for the sake of decentralization, but in Lightning Network, you need decentralization for privacy because that's how you get your privacy for routing through through many. <clears throat> well, yeah, I'm, like I'm not saying that like that there's not going to be like I, I'm not saying everything is going to just connect to one super node, but. Like, I don't think that, like, right now, um, there's, like, I think five nodes that process um, 60% of payments and, like, um, like 10 that process 80. I don't think that curve is ever going to change. Uh, like, I think there will always be those big nodes with lots of liquidity in the middle of most things, and it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Like, you only need enough decentralization to um, obscure the payment hops but beyond that like trying to add more and more and more decentralization to the network topology doesn't like the the returns diminish you know what i mean uh yeah i i don't know about that i mean think about bitcoin core they will get involved 10 years from now and they will definitely get involved in the most decentralized way possible and that could be a game changer right because now there is a bunch of there will be a bunch of Bitcoin core node that's uh, that's also acting as hubs and stuff like that. So uh, I think it can it could it could change in any moment. Lightning network is still small. Yeah, but I mean th these are just natural like incentives of economies of scale. Like the, the yeah. like the, the everything that's gonna push stuff towards like what I'm saying like that's just natural economics. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I understand that argument, but that, yeah, you know, so that is based on that uh, the Lightning Hubs are actually making money. So it's, it's, it's a market, but I, I mean, the Lightning Network is something that's, that's poised to be commoditized. So probably running hubs won't, won't be won't be a money making machine in the long term, you know, so I'm not sure that uh, that oh, okay, there is Google, Facebook and Amazon and they own 80% of the internet. Uh, I don't, I don't know if that's gonna be her. Yeah, it's possible. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's like, think about it, like you still need money like capital to, to to route things or access to that so it's like whoever has more capital is going to get more um connectivity because like i have the capital to drop my fees lower and still make money because of volume but it like you know what i mean it's like it's it's not going to be this perfectly decentralized thing um that like everybody's running in their home, but at the same time, it's not going to be like a completely centralized thing where you just connect to the Amazon super hub um, and they can just block anything they want. Like it's going to be somewhere in the middle that still is a little closer to that, that centralized um, like scenario. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I guess that would be my guess too, but it may be too early. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I don't know uh, if yeah. your voice is up to it. Any thoughts, you mean? Or uh, I guess you moving to the next one. I'm good. Yeah, let's move on. Blockstream Green. Uh, we talked about it previously. That Blockstream Green wallet is going to use Tor, uh, and they are actually pretty much innovators in. Okay, so they are using Tor with Orbot on, on Android. So it's possible already, but they will do it as a built-in Tor. And now they have early access to that. And why is it significant is because people did not figure out yet how to use Tor on iOS. And now Blockstream Green figured it out, or I guess implemented it properly. So, so I think this is awesome news. Now they will have built-in Tor on iOS and on Android, and you can do you can gain early access to it, which means uh, you cannot download it from the stores, but you can download it from the internet. Uh, so that's that's what early access means. 
Yeah, I mean, that's right. pretty cool, man. Uh, you know, like iOS is, is I, I've always thought that would be a really tough thing to, to bring network privacy to iOS with how locked down they are with what you can and can't do. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Tor is just just the protocol uh, holds, so it's it's always possible. It's just how much work do you want to put in, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so if no one has any comment, then the next topic is HTC. Uh, I choose this topic because I'm in Taiwan and HTC is a big Taiwanese flagship company. Uh, HTC, well, you guys might be much more advanced with the news because I woke up right now like... 30 minutes ago and it's 1 a.m. 30 here so I could only get involved in the original news so so I won't talk much about it and apologize if I misquote anything but you might heard that Taiwanese electronics manufacturer HTC has launched its latest blockchain phone Exodus 1S which enables users to support the Bitcoin network. There are a couple of questions that I have for this, at how they are doing that and how you, they are not draining your battery. I guess they are draining your battery if you choose to run HTC full node. But there are a couple of things like unveiling the device Saturday at the Lightning Conference in Berlin. The company claimed the new product is the first smartphone to be able to run a full node, full Bitcoin node. Now this is not true. Uh, There is AB Core, that's not a smartphone, that's an application. Uh, That's a full node for, for smartphones. So that's that's pretty much there for for a long time now it's very unpractical but but it's it's kind of working so so that's 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 not true so it's not the first and then coinbase goes on to say say that allowing it to propagate transactions and blocks anywhere which which i still cannot make sense to like what, what does it mean? So I have questions about this rather than answer. Okay, HTC reveal that uh, they can do a full node. But my question is, does it draining your battery? So do they have a solution like, oh, it, it starts synchronizing only when you are on Wi-Fi and only when when uh, when you're actually charging your phone uh, I don't know if they have solutions for this or it's just a marketing thing that's completely impractical to use so yeah do you guys heard any any more on this thing I would hope they have a only sync charging on Wi-Fi option now that's the only reason that AB core works but you know as far as using this I mean I don't really see this as like we're we're nowhere close to being able to use a full node for like daily transactions like on a mobile phone like the the use i see for this is you know it's not really that uncommon these days for somebody to only have a smartphone and that be the only device they have so like something like this i i think would just be a nice thing to have for like your cold storage and stuff and like you only sync it when it's charging at home and you only really use it for cold storage and still use like a a more conventional mobile wallet when when it comes to like daily spending and stuff but you know like a hardware wallet plus something like this like you can have a fully validated like you know cold storage stack even if the only device you have is a phone and so like that's where i see like the the niche for this being at this time because we're we're just not there where you can just have a node 
running and syncing on your phone 24 7 and just use that like the batteries are not getting up i'm not that sure about that because <clears throat> so we are not gonna increase the block size which means bitcoin technology is going one way which is getting i mean full nodes uh, bitcoin core is going one way which is getting more efficient uh, and getting more faster i think uh, i think we could get in a we could get there that people would be able to run full nodes because the social consensus is not there to to change the block size or something like that that would make running full nodes even harder although i must say that smartphones are not don't seem to be improving much anymore it's like and also the processors just general processors like they aren't improving so maybe the technology is not going to get get that far huh. no it's, i mean good... i th i think it will in, in the long term it's just like it's it's going to take 5 or 10 years you know what i mean yeah okay yeah so everyone smartphone on everyone who knows on smartphone that that i wouldn't rule out to be that to be a possibility you know mm -hmm. all right so do we want to get into this big juicy chunk of, of regulations and governments and stupid idiots all right so first up in this large chunk um Bitfinex has filed a discovery application um, in Southern California to start trying to um, gather documents and information regarding the $880 million that was seized by various government agencies uh, around the world um, from crypto capital. And like this, I, I'm honestly kind of shocked it's taken this long. Because like this, this was a one hundred percent like that. This is happening. It's just a matter of when they actually get around to it. And so, pretty much like what what they're going to have to do here is, um, if this is approved in Southern California, th this can be used as a basis to actually in other jurisdictions, um, such as uh, Poland, Portugal, the UK, and the US, uh, were the countries that actually seized the money in different accounts um, and actually try to get documentation about where this money is now um, and start digging through the records to prove um, connections between those funds and Bitfinex. But on the flip side, um, you know, at some point down the line, I don't see any way of getting out of having to defend themselves and prove to some degree that they were unaware of like all the wildly illegal shit that crypto capital was doing to actually process um, these fiat side payments. And so like th this is absolutely something to pay attention to going forward. And it's gonna be very relevant to just the overall situation there. Cause I mean, right now, like effectively there's the ongoing shenanigans from the New York attorney general um, there is the insane class action lawsuit for $1.4 trillion in damages for manipulating the entire crypto market. And now um, Finax is taking a step forward to actually, you know, ascertain the locations of these funds and try to recover them. Um, because, you know, with the um, initial exchange offering or, or whatever the fuck um, the equity offering was called, like they, they've shifted all of these liabilities from Tether to Bitfinex. So Tether is barring anything else going on solvent now. They are fully reserved. But Bitfinex now has all of the outstanding liabilities um, through this equity offering. And so like they still need to eventually get this money back or they're going to be stuck paying that off out of their operational profits for a long time. And so like, this is something, you know, we should all be paying attention to because this is going to have pretty big consequences for the overall ecosystem, whichever way it ends up playing out.
And of course, the predictable silence after talking about Tubby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we Tether just want to. awesome. It's the future of cryptocurrencies. It, it is. It is. I'm, a, I'm a fucking Tether maximalist. Toxic Tether maximalist. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So I uh, did just slide along into the, the next one. I'll probably try and get through these quick. Um, the uh, SEC, CFTC, and FinCEN issued a joint statement uh, on the 11th. Um, really, there's, there's not much here except them all reiterating um, the requirements to comply with AML um, counter-terrorism financing regulations for anybody um, considered a money service business or um, any kind of exchange also um, regulated by the Bank Secrecy Act under the SEC or CFTC. And they, they specifically point to the FinCEN clarification on what constitutes a money service business uh, that was released a, a month or so ago. And so it is pretty much just reiterating, you know, everything we know and sending the message that like they're, they're probably going to get very serious about rooting around and going through enforcement actions against things in this ecosystem. So this, I think, is, is absolutely a sign of buckle down. Um, they're they're going to start really trying to fuck with shit. Any thoughts? Yeah, so I just, I think I'm just throwing in something general privacy related that the question is, someone said on Reddit that, that asking that why, why do you even need privacy? Isn't the, isn't the point of the blockchain that it's an open, transparent ledger? And, and my answer was that, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm, I'm going in a more general direction with that, but okay, so how much money do you have? Do you feel uncomfortable by this question? Imagine how uncomfortable you would feel if I wouldn't have to ask you, ask you about it, but I could just Google it. More, if the financial history, history of your whole life would be easily accessible by anyone, sure, your grandma wouldn't mind you purchasing that pack of marijuana that one time in, when you were in the university even more dangerous when your financial history has false positive records in it. You can even get into jail because blockchain analysis artist made an incorrect assumption or that guy who's still into your girlfriend intentionally set you up to trick blockchain analysis. You know, so it just, just, just think about the, the consequences of of not having privacy with Bitcoin, they are really, really far reaching, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we are we are we are fast approaching um, the the bend over phase where the the governments of the world start getting really serious about fucking with this space, and you know, I I think if this is not a wake-up call that you should be taking your financial privacy seriously. I don't know what will be. Yeah. All right. Uh, Janine, you're up for one before I go back into another chunk. I uh, want to take us into the quick update. Yeah, so um, in the last episode and in our most recent special edition with Jeff Andrew, we talked about um, the new IRS misguidance about cryptocurrency taxes, which pretty much everyone is still not satisfied with. Um, but following the release of that guidance, the IRS has uh, since circulated a draft of the new Form 1040 uh, Schedule 1 um, for additional income and adjustments to income, which apparently includes a new question that asks, at any time during 2019, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? Uh, first of all, I don't like the fact that they say virtual currency because, I mean, if you're going based on terminology, 
uh, U.S. dollars are virtual. There's a virtual form of the U.S. dollar. I don't know if that counts, obviously. Um, but yeah, bad phrasing of the question. Uh, so you should only need to fill out this form if you're in the U.S., uh, the Schedule 1 form, if you have additional income, such as uh, capital gains, unemployment compensation, prize or award money, or gambling winnings. Um, you might also need to itemize stuff like student loan interest, self-employment taxes, educator expenses, or things like that. So unless you're basically reporting capital gains, that's, um, I mean, you could be gambling, I guess, with Bitcoin, but um, basically if you have capital gains, you sh you're probably already filling out this form. And so Coindesk, reported that the IRS has since asked its software partners to send comments on the new form in the next 30 days. But I have to say that even though I do wish that they would provide somewhere to, as we were talking about a while ago, it's about things like, you know, saying that you're not accepting fork coins or you're doing something with your fork coins to render them unspendable. Um, I don't like the fact that the the way they phrase this question, they include things like receive and acquire um, as taxable event points, because that's not correct. If you earned income via cryptocurrencies, you would have already declared that in the dollar value on your normal f as income. So unless you sold or exchanged that cryptocurrency, buying or acquiring isn't a taxable event. So that does not need to be included on this form. And until then, they have no reason to know that you have any Bitcoin. So if your way of using Bitcoin is that you've either received it as income and never bought or never never sold or exchanged it away for anything, or you've bought it and just held this entire time, you have no reason to fill out this form. So I really don't like the fact that the way this question is phrased implies that you need to do that when you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually a really good point. Even I hadn't thought of like that is a really out of line thing to put on that form. <laughs> but then again, you have to ask the question: What is the purpose of them including this question? And the answer, undoubtedly, is not that they're trying to help people get clarity or make them feel better about whether they're accurately reporting their financial life to the IRS. The point of the question is they want to know who's stupid enough to answer this question in the affirmative when they don't even have to. Mm -hmm. Sounds like typical fucking government shenanigans. Alrighty. Uh, should we just move along or you got anything to say on that, Nopa? Uh, three. All right. Well, next up, uh, just, I guess these can just be a couple quick notes. Um, the SEC halted the Telegram ICO from actually uh, launching and going live um, under the rationale that 39 U.S. purchasers um, participate in the ICO, and it's you know this is just one of those things. Um, like, I think that this whole project is retarded, but at the same time, um, yeah, like this is just another example of selective enforcement from the government. Like if you're going to enforce something, do it consistently, or this is just arbitrary gatekeeping bullshit. And, you know, next, uh, another example of that is the letter from, um, what was his name? Um, hold on one second, guys. Um, from Senator Sherrod Brown and Brian Schatz, um, they, they published this letter um, addressing the um, foundation members of the, the Libra project. And like this, this is really uh, fucked up because <laughs> it's pretty much um, just a scare tactic um, pointing to kitty porn on the internet and how scary it should be that people uh can move money around freely uh digitally on the internet because think of the children um and, and a veiled threat that all of these association members would effectively um suffer 
insane regulatory scrutiny if they move forward with their participation in this project. And, you know, again, um, I think Libra is a retarded joke. And like the, this is it's it's the, the same like double standard like arbitrary like moat that that this these government agencies have built up and they they try to play who's allowed to to play the game and you know as much as i think the idea of libra going anywhere is horrifying i mean it's just as horrifying and fucked up to watch this kind of shit happen like this is pretty much um a fucking intimidation letter from the mafia towards these companies except it has the stamp of approval of the united states government and, and that's fucking crazy to me like absolutely crazy yeah i mean we can see what's happening in china that if you if you don't have your freedoms then well you are pretty much fucked If you cannot transact, that's one kind of freedom. Then the government can do things with you that you might don't like. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, just keep moving forward. Uh, some good pace. Uh, the CME recently announced that they are seeing massive increasing interest from big investors um, to the point where the number of open contracts um, in the last quarter were 61% higher than um, a year earlier. And pretty much just, you know, buzzing through things like that, they're seeing a lot of growth, um, really, however you slice and dice the, the metrics they're looking at. And I think this is a really important thing to look at, just gauging overall market sentiment. Like a, a lot of big regulations, um, you know, or, okay, so I'm sorry, trying to have a text conversation somewhere else. Uh, I'm going to put that to an end right now. Um, <laughs> but like a lot of these big institutions and players, like they don't have a way to actually legally get their hands on Bitcoin right now. And so they look for whatever way to get that price exposure they can. And things like the, the CME futures are a perfect gauge of that. Like they can't actually get their hands on Bitcoin, so they're they're going to go speculate on these futures, and I think it's a very promising thing going forward. Considering Bact is now alive, um, you know, and they've been seeing some kind of slow, steady um, growth in floor volume, um, like a lot of things like the CME, the CBOE did initially, and I think you know it's just slow, steady pace. Like the, I don't think we're going to see a big boom event when it comes to institutional money coming in here it's just going to be a trickle that slowly builds up Alrighty. all right this this is uh okay these these next two are going to be real quick guys the bitwise etf was denied and unicef um, which recently announced that they're going to be taking crypto donations are actually going to hold those donations and keep them in crypto instead of sending for fiat. Ha! Timestamp that. That'll look really weird. Okay, so if there's no thoughts on anything else, I think uh, you are up with a uh, little news story from Chain Analysis, no part. I mean, there is a UNICEF keeping crypto donations in crypto. See, I, I, I covered that so fast, you didn't even hear it. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add... Uh, okay, then I have a comment to that. That It's a... Uh, oh, boy. Okay, so first of all, I, I, I looked at it and it's using Coinbase. So that's that's interesting there. But on the other hand... I don't know, man. I mean, Bitcoin is good for peer-to-peer -peer donations. And if you are donating for large organizations, then you... I, I don't want to accuse anything, but, but, but it's a fact that you, you have no idea where that donation is going. Uh, and, and one example for this 
is that in 2014, I asked, uh, th there was the umbrella revolution in Hong Kong, and I asked uh, the guy if he would accept uh, Bitcoin donations, and he said yes. And a lot of people were donating, 3.7 Bitcoin came in, and then he came out and said that, oh yeah, he, he lost his, his phone because he was sleeping on the street and stuff. And, and he didn't have a backup. And now this, there comes the accountability part that, well, if you really lost your phone, then the Bitcoins are not moving. And I'm still checking it. It's 2019 now for four years, I was checking like every month that, hey, do, do those Bitcoin move? And, and they don't. So, I mean, on, on the one hand, it, it said that, but, but you could keep him accountable that, hey, those, those donations where, where they are going, you know, and yeah, in this case, they are going nowhere, but, but with, with UNICEF, it's, it's nice they are trying to do that, but I would really prefer peer-to-peer -peer donations. I remember that, uh, I had a bunch of EU, EU food and shit in my, when I was in university because they were just so misallocated in Hungary, that, that's crazy. And, and I had that and I was, I was living on those things, EU supplies, yeah. So, I don't know man, just, just if you want, keep, keep peer-to-peer -peer donations. Okay, so the next story is chain analysis. This is going to be a quick one too. Uh, if, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Welcome to Video. <laughs> I'm not. So Welcome to Video was a child pornography website that operated out of South Korea, allowed users to buy content with Bitcoin or upload their own. Uh, and Chainalysis reactor. So th this is a perfect example when Chainalysis just traced back the the people behind it and 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 they took it down. So good for them. Yeah, we can move on to to CIA FBI editing Wikipedia. Alright, you're up, Janine. Yeah, so this isn't really a Bitcoin story, but um, still probably important to me. My perspective on it isn't going to be nearly as positive as some people's, but basically a guy named Virgil Griffith created a tool called Wikiscanner, which allows you to track what computers were used to make changes to Wikipedia. It's kind of, I haven't taken a look at it. It's a bit imprecise in all the media reporting, so I don't know what it means by track what computers were used. I assume that it's basically just catching the IP address somehow or something. I have no idea. Hopefully it's not too invasive because otherwise you're going to be de-anonymizing uh, a bunch of people who don't deserve that. But anyway, if you haven't heard of Virgil Griffith, um, he's not actually a guy who considers these ethical quandaries much because he left the Tor project a few years ago based on accusations that he was selling data on Tor hidden service users to Interpol and the government of Singapore, which violated ethical guidelines for network systems research. And I didn't actually look too much into those claims back then. A lot was going on, but since then, he has become the head of special projects for the Ethereum Foundation and was quoted saying in an, inter in, in an interview that it would be really great if the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund would invest a trillion dollars into the Ethereum space. So let's say I won't be giving him much benefit of the doubt. Um, anyway, disclaimer aside, uh, basically, as a result of Wikiscanner going up, people were apparently able to see that the CIA and FBI have been editing Wikipedia pages related to people, places, historical events, or operations that are relevant to them, which, if true, would be in violation of Wikipedia's conflict of interest guidelines. Uh, for example, it was found that supposedly CIA computers were used to edit an entry on the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003 to basically throw doubt on, you know, whether the casualties were correctly estimated and things like that. 
Um, they were also editing a profile of a former CIA chief, and the FBI was removing things from Guantanamo Bay pages uh, relating to their prison system there and how they were treating uh, terrorism suspects. Um, so yeah, uh, the problem I do have with this though is, like I said, I'm going to have to look into more about how this was actually tracking what computers are being used, but assuming it's just using IP addresses and maybe browser fingerprinting, I don't know, hopefully Wikipedia is not keeping that, but if they are, um, yeah, basically I hope that any of you who have been editing Wikipedia, um, hopefully you were using at least a VPN, if not Tor or some other anonymization source, because, uh, yeah, you don't really want your edits, your entire history of edits, to be able to be traced back to, you know, a specific computer or maybe a specific location. So I'm, at this point, I can't say that I'm really too excited about this, especially considering, like, it's not a big revelation that the CIA and FBI have probably been ed editing Wikipedia. Like, if they weren't doing that, I would be really surprised. Um, and this is just another warning that Wikipedia, the text, is not usually a great resource to get inform to get reliable information. I mean, uh, it's always recommended that if you use Wikipedia as a source or something, that you go directly to the source links that are at the bottom, so that you're at least hopefully getting some primary or at least secondary sources and not relying on someone's summary on Wikipedia. But yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm happy about this project considering the consequences and not too many benefits. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if people would care that much about it because most people kind of want to tell the world that, hey, I'm that very smart people who is editing Wikipedia all the time. Uh, the problem is when, when you are, when you are well, I I know a couple of things about Tiananmen Square, but I really don't want to. But I really don't want to to fuck up my ability to go to China, right? So it's like that. That's when it goes goes wrong. Okay, I have got to stop having this side channel conversation. While we're doing the show, I just, I, I just, I have no idea what to say because I just missed everything you guys just said. So basically, a, uh, in summary, a guy who I know, uh, I'm familiar with him because he was kicked out of the Tor project for violence on network research, um, and he's also at the Ethereum Foundation and said that he would love the Saudi government to invest a trillion dollars in Ethereum. Basically, he created this wiki scanner tool. Um, and it's debatable to me whether the consequences, which may include de-anonymizing people um, besides the FBI and CIA, I don't know if that's worth the cost um, based on the benefits, which appear to just be, oh yeah, the intelligence agencies are editing Wikipedia. Who didn't know that? So that's basically a summary. Yeah, but okay, so technical question is, how, how do you... How do you even get any information if you are you don't have access to Wikipedia servers in the first place? Is that the case, or he has access? Okay, okay, that's it. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. Okay, all right. Um, okay, okay. Well, what story are we talking about? Uh, well, well, Janine, uh, sorts her connection out. Uh, okay. Guys, <laughs> oh my god, this is so bad right now. I'm sorry, you guys. So, so you guys cannot hear me properly. No, I, I can hear you right now. Her her connection was just a little glitchy, and I um I I wasn't paying attention because I'm I'm arguing with some developers right now about something. Gina, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm not sure if it was me or you or both of us. I think it was me though. Yeah, never mind. So my my question was: Is how does he able to figure out anything if he doesn't have access to Wikipedia servers? 
or does he have access to that? Um, like I said, I haven't I haven't actually gone to the thing and checked out um, it, but I assume that if he's able to identify that, okay, I mean, he, yeah, either Wikipedia is doing something really bad where they're exposing IP addresses and possibly more than that, or he has access. Um, I don't know, maybe Wikipedia has an open API for that. Um, but either way, someone's doing something that I don't think I really approve of. All right. Let's move on to Assange. Oh, we're already Assange. Um, yeah, so basically on October 21st, there was another case management hearing at Westminster Magistrates Court. And he was in front of a judge he's come in front of before. Basically, all the judges in the UK suck that he's come before. And basically, what his legal team has been trying to do, the extradition request from the US is not valid because the UK does not allow extradition for political, what it sees as political crimes. And I'm not sure if, I haven't checked whether the treaty explicitly says that they recognize um, espionage-related charges to be a political crime, but I'm pretty sure that under any definition of political crime, espionage would be included. And since that's the bulk of the charges, um, I can't see how they can ignore that. Uh, well, I can't see how they can ignore that legally or legitimately in any way. Um, another thing they wanted to do is, I've talked a number of times when I've given updates, that there's an ongoing case in Spain right now um, because the security company that was supposed to be uh, providing surveillance and security over the Ecuadorian embassy since, uh, I can't remember the year when they started, but I think since 2016 or 2017, um, they basically have been surveilling Assange and his conversations with lawyers, his conversations with journalists and friends and family and they've been <laughs> they've been sending that not only back to um, their headquarters in Spain, but they have been directly sharing it with the CIA. And this is this was acknowledged by emails that have surfaced through the court case in Spain. And the CEO of the company is currently um, I don't know if out on parole is a good or the correct term, but he's. He is not currently in jail, but he uh, is considered a flight risk, and so his passport was seized, and his company is being investigated and everything. Um, so what was supposed to happen on the 21st is that uh, his legal team, well, what did happen is his legal team was going to ask that they give more time for the their team to collect evidence and analyze the results of what's going on in Spain, because it's extremely relevant in combination with the espionage charges being political and possibly invalidating the extradition request. And uh, basically, they're all the, like I said, all the judges that he's gone before have been completely corrupt, and they're willing to subvert their own legal processes to uh, act against his favor and what was observed according to Craig Murray, who is a former UK diplomat, is that the judge was exclusively listening to requests from the representatives of the US government um, and taking their requests into consideration and basically being very inattentive and unsympathetic to any of the requests that Assange's legal team was making, even bare minimum ones that should have been very reasonable. Um, so that's what happened. Basic and another thing, even worse, is that uh, I don't remember the exact dates, but the judge who is pre presiding over the case in Spain actually sent a official an official investigation request to authorities in the UK, saying, "You have a person, Assange, who I want to interview as a witness because he is, you know, one of the victims in this case. He was being surveilled." Um, <laughs> and I want to interview him, which should have been completely normal, but the UK has already rejected it. I don't know if it's a final rejection, but it was at least their their initial response is that they're not going to accept 
that request, which is completely bonkers um, that that's happening. And uh, the even scarier part is that um, according to people who were able to attend the hearing on the 21st, um, when Assange entered the courtroom, he had a limp and when he was supposed to answer questions like provide his name and his date of birth, which they apparently do at all of these hearings, um, he was very, very slow to respond. And when he did respond, he was talking about how he can't think properly, he doesn't really understand what's going on, and he feels that this whole process is very unfair because the U.S. government has had 10 years to prepare and he's only recently been able to even access a computer where he can, you know, access documents and writing related to his own case. And I believe, <coughs> I believe he's still limited to two visits a month. I can't remember how long they were, like an hour, maybe hour, two hours, which that's not visits of like friends and family. It's, that also includes visits with lawyers, which basically means that two times a month he has to choose or someone has to choose between whether he should be talking to his lawyers or whether he, you know, should be having a social visit, which you need because he's being isolated in solitary confinement 20, about 23 hours or 22 hours out of the day. And so he needs the social visits, but he also needs to talk to his lawyers because his access to his own case information is extremely limited. So basically, the UK government is a fucking shit show, and I think anyone who is currently living there, uh, who has any influence over what's going on, you know, you should be attending the court because that's actually putting a lot of pressure on them. Uh, they're they're clearly afraid of the amount of people who are t taking the time out of their day to go and visit the court um, and the prison as well in great numbers. Um, and also, if you, you know, anything else you can do, you should be doing it because the UK is, their whole legal system is a fucking disgrace right now. And uh, basically, I'm going to repeat what Lori Love said um, back in June, which is that you shouldn't give yourself the luxury of being a bystander you know, in any small way, if you can avoid being a bystander, you should do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I don't even know what the fuck to think anymore when, like, I see what's going on with signs. It's like, they're, they're just going to railroad them. Like, it, it's it's so clear at this point. Like, they, they don't give a fuck about anything except just completely railroading them. Ah, man. Voice, uh, not doing too well after that, James. Um, well, actually, my voice has been getting better the more I talk, because I think it has something to do with, you know, <laughs> just not, not exercising it as much recently. What's the best case scenario for Assange? Um, I mean, I think... Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like a non-bad scenario. Um, the least non-bad scenario is that he basically gets moved eventually to a more comfortable prison than a maximum security prison if they end up having to fight this entire extradition case in the UK for several years because um, basically his health is not in a state where he can continue to survive in the conditions that he's being kept in. So the, you know, the very minimum that I'm hoping for from the UK, which is not much, is that they, you know, stop putting him in solitary confinement, stop abusing him. Um, there's even suspicion that they're giving him drugs. Uh, I don't know what for, whether to keep him sedated or possibly just to intentionally harm him or something, but hopefully they will stop that if they're doing that. Um, I mean, I don't know, best best case scenario is that we all fucking arrive there and break him out of this prison um, because, sorry, UK, you're a tiny island, you don't have a lot of people, and you also don't believe in guns. Um, I'm sure the people in the prison have guns, but you certainly don't have enough. So seriously, I would so 
fully support, you know, someone storming into the prison and ending this entire facade because that would be more just than anything that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. It's people don't want to fucking do anything until it's personally standing in front of them on their own doorstep. And it's just a shame. Well, you, you guys want to move along into the next one, I guess? Yeah, let's go. Well, um, kind of really conflicted on this one. Um, so Blockchain Info is launching D-Gold, their own token, uh, which is built on uh, – Commerce Blocks Ocean platform, which is pretty much a fork of elements from Blockstream. Um, and they're creating a, a gold backed token because apparently during their um, inquiries with their customer, digitized gold is one of the things everybody's been screaming for. And really, like, I, I don't really have anything against the idea of doing this like it's it's being done on a federated platform so they're not lying about about the trust model of the token um at least through through what they're they're building it on um but they are absolutely lying um in in how they're they're trying to pitch this they they, they literally use the word trustless they they literally use the word trustlessly holding digital gold to describe a token that you just have to trust some dude actually has gold for in a vault somewhere um no that's absolutely not trustless at all um this is a completely trust-based system so like honestly it, it's really weird because the, the the general concept of doing this i don't really have any issues with but i can see right now what's going to happen um, blockchain is going to start trying to shill this to everybody, roll it into their, their web wallet, try to, oh, Bitcoin is dead because of this. And this is just another fucking attack vector, um, pretty much because they're so incompetent and retarded that instead of actually just keeping up with Bitcoin development, the, the thing that was the core of their business, um, they're, they're spending all of their time doing retard shit like this and falling way behind. And so it's it, it, it's it, it, it's mind boggling. Like the, this company is taking what could be a very solid viable idea, and I almost guarantee you're going to find some way to fuck it up and completely destroy their company's reputation even further. Um, as this just evolves into a, another thing, um, they're trying to shove people in while arguing Bitcoin is dead. So yeah, that's that's happening. You know what's what's funny. When I got involved in Bitcoin, um, one of the very first person I met was actually a guy who created a altcoin that that was supposed to be a stable coin. Uh, I'm not sure what was its name. There were like 30 altcoins at that time. Uh, it was called something like Gold Reserve Coin, and his idea was, I mean, don't laugh, it was a revolutionary idea at that time that he he puts gold in the bank on his own account and then people buy this altcoin and it's gonna keep the price or something like that the exact same thing have been tried before and that didn't work out <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like i i don't see how this escapes like all the the trappings of the legacy system and kyc fucking you know to, to, i mean it's gold like it's a commodity like it has the same kind of tax implications as bitcoin so it's it's like you know, what what the fuck are they doing here like i i, I could understand like a, a company that is not a bitcoin company trying to do something like this to you know break into a market but like a bitcoin company pivoting further and further away into shit like this it's like what what the fuck are you thinking like, are, are you retarded? Yes, but on the other hand, it's good because 
look at what Coinbase and Blockchain Info and BitPay and all these these Bitcoin companies who are moving to the legacy direction are doing like stupid things and that's why they are gonna go out of business it's 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 good look at the good side oh all right so uh i guess let's just dive into the next one um there was a updated taproot proposal um pushed to the mailing list uh so i i don't remember Hold on. On the ninth, so a, a little while ago, actually, um, and it's it's pretty much the the gist of it is um, a few tweaks and um, what you call it. I think uh, deprecating the pay to script hash support. Um, and like honestly, um, anybody out there who is really spazzing out about the the lack of pay to script hash support for this um i think you should go back and watch the episode okay one of these days i'm going to figure out how you you instantly know what episode shit was in um but the the episode where we talked about the initial taproot proposal um you know at, at this point the idea of thinking that hashing a public key is a a meaningful defense against a quantum computer breaking encryption it's 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 security theater 40 percent of coins are outright stored in reused keys where the public key has been exposed publicly visible on chain and then whatever other percent of people are using spv wallets um whatever node they're connected to um like for the the service that the the wallet runs it has all their public keys. So you just hack a few um, wallet providers like that and pretty much the entire coin supply is, is broken from a quantum computer attack point. So the idea that just hashing things with pay to script hash provides security, um, it's, it's a fantasy. And frankly, like doing that breaks fungibility because the whole idea of Taproot and Schnorr is to move everything into looking the same on chain unless an inner taproot script is used and having a page of script hash version of this um like that that's that breaks that fungibility benefit so like, i i am fully on board with a taproot schnorr proposal that does not support page of script hash and i really think if you, if you want that you should really sit down and think it through because it doesn't offer any meaningful security it's just destroying fungibility to feel like you're safe when you're really not can you sorry can you repeat that summary again so now it's a proposal to do traproot without uh hashing or with hashing and um, with, it's, it's, fungibility? um the oh, um one second um if if you support taproot um both with the raw public key and nesting it in a pay to script hash um you're breaking fungibility because the whole point of moving to schnorr and taproot is everybody moves into that and everything looks the same and so if you have people using pay to script hash on top of that like it, it everything doesn't look the same so like it, it's you, you're giving up a lot of privacy gains to feel like you're safe from a quantum computer when you're not because the whole coin supply is pretty much open to attack. And if you're the one person whose keys are safe, um, that doesn't do you any good. The whole system is broken and worthless. Um, but you know, other than that, um, really the, the big change um, is a, um, a drop um, of a um, script size limitation, um, an increase of how deep a Merkle tree can be in um, the um, taproot tree and um, you know really it's there's not too many significant changes but um, you know a anybody who's thinking about really trying to fight this because of the lack of pay to script hash like it don't man. like it, it doesn't actually make anything safer and it damages the attempts to improve privacy on chain Yeah, I'm really sad that a new debate is coming out because this just means it's gonna take 
longer, much, much longer. All right, so quick update on do you guys remember I bought the Tamba Bit Plus Plus paper on Springler? Uh, this was a PDF, and I kid you not, they sent me an invoice in post and with the post office. Like, like what the heck? Like, where, where do they live? Like, in the Stone Age or, or what? Like, seriously, I buy a PDF online and they post me an invoice for that. It's, it's so crazy. Yeah, let's move on to Casa. Alrighty then. Um, so our resident security expert, air quotes, Mr. Wookie, um, spurred out on Twitter uh, the other week because, um, well, two two reasons honestly. Um, the fact that Casa. Um, their their node has users connect to it through an unencrypted HTTP connection over their local network, and spurging out about how this is a security vulnerability, um, and, and and that is not strictly wrong, but the the reality is that browsers are not going to just recognize strange certificates on a local network that is not baked into the certificate authority of that browser. And so if you try to encrypt it, um, your browser is going to pop up a big warning that says, don't click this, it's not safe, um, we don't trust this. And that's a nightmare for newbies. And CASA's entire business model is literally building tools for newbies. So for the, the, the way people have been painting this as if it's some unexcusable, egregious security fuck up. Um, no, that, that's not what's going on here. Um, it's just the, the reality is being a company trying to build things for newbies, um, there are tough design decisions. And this is just one of those situations where um, for now, there's there's not really much better solutions that, that are actually going to have a product that a newbie can just drop on the, the desk, plug in, and it just works. And that's it's just how it is. And also ultimately, like the only seed or wallet actually on this device is for your lightning node, which everybody paying attention to um should realize you don't just shove a shit ton of money onto lightning right now. Um, you're not going to make money routing. Um, it, it's not big enough for that. Um, it, it, this is still an in-development protocol. And so like, you should not, if you are listening to this company, even be putting sizable amounts of money on this at all. And as well, there were a couple times where he tried to imply that the, this issue with the CASA node had some kind of effect on their multi-sig product. And that, that is just absolutely bullshit like the keys on that node for your lightning software have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with your casa multi-sig if you use their service for that so that is something completely manipulative um mr wookie was doing to try and bolster his image as a security expert and as well um you know the, there was a the the issue that every node is pretty much hard-coded with the same password and that's a that's a problem there too. That is just you're stuck in a rock in a hard place when it comes to design decisions. Because ultimately, if you don't have something set up like that where Casa is capable of of saving you the noob when you fuck up, um, losing that password or access to the device, you're you're fucked. Um, anything in a channel um, is gone unless your other counterparty um, cooperates with you. Um, because the seed only backs up your on-chain funds. And so like, you know, this, this is like, there, there are things CASA could do to improve this. Um, I'm confident they will, but th this whole issue has been wildly blown out of proportions by a fraudulent retard 
who is just desperately flailing around to find any way he can to make a name for himself in this space. And I'm going down on record right now. Uh, mark my words, in the next six months or a year or something, this retard is going to be showing some broken, horribly designed multi-sig thing he built. Um, and you'll see that this going after Casa was him just trying to, to get cred to, to launch whatever retard multi-sig thing he's building. So th that's really my two cents on that. Security features those are not used are not very secure, are they? I mean, I think it's also important to mention that he's not only trying to bolster his image as a security researcher, which we discovered kind of too late last year was definitely not the case. Um, the other reason he's doing this is because he's pissed off that his threat model is no longer on the Bitcoin resources page that Jameson Lop runs. And so he's pissed off at Lop for that and has basically been putting a lot of effort into shit talking him for the past, you know, half year or so or more. So this doesn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Alrighty then. Uh, move along. I think this will be my last story. Um, I wanted to go over an update to this project called Bitsniff um, that was initially um, put together, I think, sometime in September um, at a hackathon in Israel. Um, and it was just recently updated. But this, um, this is a real scary thing to think about at scale. And it is a perfect example of why the peer-to-peer the -peer layer of Bitcoin that, that moves data between nodes, um, it, it needs to get as absolutely disconnected from the internet as it possibly can be. So the, the gist of this is pretty much um, through timing analysis, identifying any Bitcoin traffic and a specific connection, I'm assuming you have the point of view of an internet service provider, um, even if the traffic is encrypted. And for anybody who knows anything, um, it's, it's not even encrypted um, as far as the, the communications between nodes. Um, so even encrypting that, which is something a lot of developers have been trying to move towards for a while, um, it, it still leaves this kind of issue open. And so pretty much what, what they do is all of the blockchain data is public. So an entity is able to literally look at the blocks um, as they're found and exactly see like, you know, this is when a block was found. So now I can compare that time against all of the user's connections that I have access to. And I can look for traffic spikes around the time that a block is found because that is gonna be a big uptick in traffic. And th they can take this a step further by actually, um, in addition to comparing their subjects traffic against the real Bitcoin block times, um, they just generate a bunch of random fake ones that don't actually match the, the block times. And they compare their targets traffic against the real block times and all of these random models. And what this allows them to do is filter out false positives. Because if, if your target's traffic matches the real Bitcoin um, block intervals and timings as much as it matches all of these random ones that you generated, then it, it's probably a false positive. And so they can literally, um, ISPs out there, identify even on encrypted traffics, um, anybody running a Bitcoin node. And th this even goes for compact blocks. Even with the, the efficiency gains in relaying with compact blocks, there is still a noticeable enough spike in traffic around the time a block is found to over time identify people running a node. So like, you know, for, for anybody who really appreciates the, the efficiency gain in compact blocks, that should be scary. Because you, you, you've literally dropped relaying the whole couple megabyte block to just tens of kilobytes of data. And even that is enough over time to statistically identify people running a Bitcoin node. And so 
to really deal with that issue, like we're going to have to take a mechanism that made relaying blocks exponentially more efficient and make that exponentially more efficient to really deal with the, this kind of issue. And like point blank, um, like th there's really um, no guaranteed way to address this issue except using the block stream satellite feed or some kind of thing you hack together out of a mesh network. Like th there is no other way right now to actually address this kind of attack that could identify anybody running a Bitcoin node. And that should be terrifying and show how absolutely important it is to have relay mechanisms for this network that are completely disconnected from the internet so that you do not have this high view um, perspective an ISP has where they can pull these kinds of attacks. Otherwise, they're going to be able to identify any participant on this network trivially. Yeah, I mean, I sympathize with the idea of trying to hide that you are involved in Bitcoin, but it just, uh, it just, it just not practical. I mean, you would be able to hide one specific things, and then there are one hundred other clues that you leave. Uh, it, uh, I don't know if it's, uh, it's, it's not possible. Well, I mean, if, if we get off of the internet, it's possible, but yeah, like if, if, if you're planning on um, using the internet as your relay mechanism, but yeah, I mean, that's, I, I don't see any way to, to deal with this except literal compression magic, um, <laughs> fucking uh, whatever that stupid show is style. Uh, Silicon Any Valley. Anyhow. How about moving on to the last topic today? Uh, second to last, actually, I think. But yeah. Yeah, uh, go but for the it. second is the almost the same. It's. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, just, just, yeah. Hey, ignore me. Jump into it. So, Hong Kong. And this is going to be a big topic. And please tell me if I'm doing it too long. Or, yeah, just, just stop me. <laughs> uh, so. I hate to break it to you, but all Americans who are listening to this, you are China's bitch. <laughs> so I, I so don't want to hear you say it, and... Fuck the Chinese government. Wait, so if the U wait if the U.S. is China's bitch and the U.K. is the U.S.'s bitch, that's that's a human centipede right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean the whole world except Chinese America's bitch. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so yeah, I, I don't know how familiar you guys with with the whole Hong Kong situation, but uh, but oh boy, the Chinese censorship is going is 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 being exported to 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 like everywhere else in the world. Um, just a quick recap on Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, and Macau. So th there are a lot of places, a lot of Chinese places or places in China who really don't want to be China. Uh, some of them are not China. So I'm not sure you're familiar with the Dalai Lama. That's, uh, that's a big no-no in China. Uh, Nepal, Tibet... Uh, Macau, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, all these places that China is trying to unify itself. I really don't want the unification. Now, some of them are actually part of China, or most of them, and one of it is Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a city uh, in the east of China, and Hong Kong has the largest voice, although not they are the most, not not they are doing the worst. I mean, there are Muslims in re-education camps in China, but but Hong Kong people have a have a voice, 
have a huge international voice and they have high speed internet and they are live streaming everything that's happening all the time and uh, yeah crazy things are happening there so i want to concentrate on the geeky direction of this but but i will i will i will quickly summarize the non geeky things like like american companies are censoring american people for speaking in support of hong kong um, or or even taiwan like like vans uh, Wens had a competition that who could who could send in the best uh, shoe design, and the Hong Kong supporter did that uh, with the Hong Kong shoe po- support the Vans shoe, and then Vans, well, that's not cool. We are gonna lose our China business, so we are gonna take that down. American Airlines and a bunch of other companies were <laughs> pressured into putting Taiwan as a Taiwan province of China or Taiwan part of China or things like that in their websites as as people are flying there, which which is just not true. It's, I'm here in Taiwan and it's an independent country with its own military, own currency, own political system, everything. So NBA was probably what what most of you have heard about i don't know much about mba i guess it's some people about throwing balls to baskets or something like that but uh, there was a manager of the houston uh, rockets and they are and he, he tweeted that stand with freedom oh no free Hong Kong or something like that. Sorry, I don't remember exactly. But that tweet, well, China didn't like it. And China banned the NBA, which is a huge thing in China. Uh, it's like, uh, that's that's their national sport, sport uh, basketball. So China banned the whole NBA. The NBA came to apologize and then they withdraw their apology. And then... Uh, that uh, guy uh, who I don't remember his name is probably the greatest basketball player of all time came out to to say that oh Mori the manager was not educated on the China issue so he shouldn't have tweeted for fight for Hong Kong, Hong Kong stand with oh yes that was the tweet fight for freedom stand with hong kong so so anyway then we get into this whole controversy and now a bunch of bunch of american people who were watching the nba just realized that oh well they're they're speeching in 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 america is actually not that free because of china uh, the last uh, known or less geeky stuff is south park where South Park was one of the very few, few, well, it's not a company, but one of the very few organization or, 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 or content creator, large content creator that came out in support of, not, not in support of the Hong Kong protest, but in, in, in trying to break down the, the China's censorship things in America. So South Park was saying things like, well, fuck the Chinese government because they are censoring everything that uh, that American companies are would be doing. And they made them, made Disney rewrite their scripts and things like that. And finally, the the last, last story, which I'm, I just I just got into this rabbit hole is regarding Blizzard. Blizzard is the gaming company behind World of Warcraft and their other game is Hearthstone. And in Taiwan there was a Hearthstone competition and the guy who who won the inter, who won the competition called Blitz Chang uh, came to the after interview of that competition 
and he he put on a mask you know um a gas mask as in hong kong they have to wear that because the police are indiscriminately uh throwing uh stuff at people so and and he said liberate hong kong revolution of our age in that podcast in chinese and then the guy has been banned for one year from hearthstone by blizzard took away ten thousand dollar of his price money uh the two reporters who were who were interviewing with interviewing the guy has been uh fired now the gamers went nuts like oh my god like i i didn't know that it's possible to to report on such story with in so interesting way but i I don't know gamers have just 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 extremely well well do everything and and they don't usually get involved in politics but anyway it's very interesting if you you google blizzard and and just look at inter just look at uh, youtube videos or something like that uh, about gamers going nuts on blizzard that how could they do that now then blizzard um getting the heat for everything they they came back and uh okay we we are only suspending blitzshank for six months and we give him his prize money and uh commentators the, the interviewers are not fired only suspended for six months so they they came they withdraw their initial decision but then they did a bunch of other things like they well they they entirely stopped doing post game interviews because well if someone coming out in support of hong kong again that's going to be bad for their chinese market uh they canceled the nintendo event because <laughs> because they were they were afraid there will be people who are voicing their opinions on hong kong they there were some university students uh, from the us who show up a sign to free hong kong boycott blizzard uh now they got banned too for half a month and it went to congress and the the congress wrote a letter to blizzard that hey guys this is not cool what you're doing um it it went to left and right uh, politician uh, left and right uh, channels uh those are really in behind of 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 bashing bizarre blizzard like like this thing actually unites american political uh, landscape <laughs> so it's, it's kind of crazy and i want to say about this is that there is going to be blizzcon which is a huge conference uh that's that's doing blizzard uh and in blizzcon a bunch of people are going to dress like well are going to try to dress like winnie the Pooh. Uh, because Winnie the Pooh is banned in China because he looks like Xi Jinping, the Chinese dictator. So that's going to be very, very interesting. There is huge protests uh, being organized in America for BlizzCon, and it's 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 one or two weeks. Uh, so you guys can 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 see how things are going to turn out on blizzcon oh and and a bunch of people are also planning to cosplay cosplay may uh which is an overwatch character chinese overwatch character uh overwatch is also a blizzard game and may became the became a symbol of the hong kong protest and their idea was to okay let's let's all make may became a symbol of the hong kong protest so blizzard get banned in china <laughs> so 
yeah the, the, it's so many things are happening in 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 this this with this blizzard story blizzard is trying to censor everything left and right and yeah, it's it's just it's just it's just amazing to see that how gamers are really united uh, behind Hong Kong and against Blizzard, more against Blizzard. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I just had a really great impression of the gamers. They are they are really smart and 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 really good at voicing their opinions. I'm I'm, I'm impressed by them. Yeah. So that's that's Dude. about the story. First off, who the fuck thought they had permission to say anything critical of Chinese politics? But uh, <laughs> on a second note, though, um, gamers are downstream of politics. Um, the the entire twenty sixteen election in America. Um, you're welcome uh, from gamers to, to, to normies out there because that's literally what what steered the entire fucking thing. Like wait, all that election wait. was was the people involved in Gamergate um, finding themselves in more mainstream positions and applying the same kind of sociopathic uh, propaganda manipulation that was done in Gamergate except to national politics. So yeah, that that explains why it's so horrible, and I would not thank them for that. <laughs> you should, because this is what's fucking driving things towards hitting the wall, so we can put shit back together. And the fact that like that these companies, like Blizzard particularly, has pissed off gamers, they fucked up because that is a consumer base that does not roll over. Like, this is not going away, <coughs> and this is going to wind up having very bad consequences for Blizzard. Very bad. I, I, I have no idea what BlizzCon is, but I cannot be more excited about that <laughs> than ever. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been with PewDiePie, too. <laughs> yep. Ah oh, man, it's it's like I, I'm I'm really happy to see the the few people in this country who have the balls to stand up to this shit. Like seriously, like Matt fucking uh, Stone, Trey Parker, like like those guys are those guys are completely unironically American heroes. Like fuck the money and the bullshit. Fucking like fuck fuck the Chinese government. Like, just call it out. Like, if you will not just boldly call that out, you are a fucking pussy. You know, what is the Chinese search engine called? Bing Bong on... Baidu? Bai, Baidu, yeah, that, that's it. Uh, after the episode of Blog Digest today, let's let's try to Google Blog... Try to go oh my god. <laughs> Try to Baidu blog digest and let's see if we get banned there too or not. <laughs> well, if we do, I don't give a fuck. In fact, you know, like uh whatchamacallit, you know, like you said you uh you kinda wanted to take a little, a little break until you get out of Taiwan just because of the sleep schedules. I like the the way we have uh that that mountain shot of Boulder place holding rick screen i'm gonna put the fucking taiwanese flag on yours until you get back <laughs> if i go away what are you gonna replace me with well you better not uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh i don't know that's an interesting question I, I'll, I'll have to think about that All so, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is a real good uh, breakdown of all that, no fire. So, yeah. Jean, Jean, or, sorry, but uh, yeah, okay. It, uh, any more comments on this? If not, uh, Janine, you want to take us into the last one? Yeah, so, um, yeah, again, it's another Hong Kong story, but you, if you've been following all of this, you may have seen reporting from the Hong Kong Free Press Organization, um, 
because they've been trying really hard to report on what's going on, even when a lot of mainstream media outlets haven't. And something interesting that happened with them in the last month or so is that they have had to change payment processors for their Bitcoin donations. Um, if you knew about them before this month, they've been accepting Bitcoin donations via BitPay since uh, June 2015. But lately, BitPay has been holding out on a large portion of their recent donations because according to BitPay, Hong Kong's banks don't support IBAN, the international standard for um, <coughs> identifying bank accounts while uh, sending financial transactions. Oh my god, my voice is awful. <laughs> so, um, at first, um, the Hong Kong Free Press Association just suspended their Bitcoin donations um, as an option, but on October 10th, and I completely missed this actually because I was too busy with the conference, but before the conference, they announced that they would be accepting Bitcoin donations once again through BTC Pay Server um, because they said it would help not only eliminate processing fees, but allow readers to make fully anonymous contributions, um, which is no longer, well, I don't, I think it, it's possible to do peer-to-peer -peer ones that you don't have to KYC yourself, but um, as we've reported before, BTC, um, B, BitPay, <laughs> sorry, BitPay has recently added KYC in the last couple of months, so you can't really be anonymous anymore. Um, but it was really great uh, to see that that's what they chose because um, if you were at the Lightning Conference this past weekend, you probably saw that a lot of people were fans of BTC Pay Server and what they're building. And I actually, in my talk, um, Lightning for Journalism, I, met, I, Lightning for Journalism, I mentioned two services or two applications that work with BTC Pay Server, which is the Lightning publisher for WordPress and Libra Patron. And uh, so this is exactly the kind of use case that I said would be important in terms of journalists adopting Bitcoin uh, for censorship resistance and also streaming money type applications. So if you're in a similar situation and you think you need to censorship resistant way to fund your work, you should ch definitely check out BTC Pay Server. Um, and um, I did make a point of mentioning the situation in Hong Kong as being, you know, a use case for, you know, a, a situation where there's censorship happening and there's a lot of opportunity, especially when you have an international, it's like an international media frenzy right now on this topic. So um, I'm really looking forward to this playing out because um, I didn't even realize this happened until a day or two ago because I was busy with the Lightning Conference. So it's really cool that this happened. You know what I find really interesting here is that I was in BTC Pay Day and Nicola Dorier gave a presentation about BTC Pay and he did it in a more philosophical way and his main message was be like water. Uh, he's not trying to, to replace BitPay, uh, get BitPay's existing customers but he's trying to look for cracks in BitPay uh, where, where BitPay cannot serve their existing customers anymore or just doesn't want to and trying to fill the gaps. Uh, so be like water. And be like water is actually the main slogan of the Hong Kong protesters too when they realize that well, they cannot come together and be millions of people in one place because the police comes and shut them down. Uh, so they 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 change tactics and they started to go just appear in in smaller and larger groups in all over uh, Hong Kong and the police don't really know where to go and where to shut them down. So that's the be like water Bruce Lee philosophy. So yeah, let, let that be my final thought. Uh, be like water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, this is like, you know, I, this, this is one of the, those things like I, I don't care uh, what the hell your, your political ideology or, or slant is 
uh, if you look at what's going on in Hong Kong and think that the Chinese Communist Party is justified in what they're doing, um, I think you are a subhuman piece of shit. And I have zero respect for you. But yeah, uh, on that insulting note, uh, <laughs> any other uh, non-Hong Kong uh, related final thoughts to wrap up on? Um, sorry, had to clear my throat there. Uh, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it during the Libra stuff, but I found it especially funny that Mark Zuckerberg mentioned that he's trying to build a regulated centralized alternative uh, to what is currently available, I guess, in the financial sector with Libra. Uh, so it looks like they've already backtracked on Libra eventually transitioning to something, I don't know, to centralize. I guess that's not happening anymore. Um, also, would just like to note that he uh, testified today and the CEO of Bitcoin was not available. Apparently, he's like <laughs> never available for anything. Um, <laughs> and uh, another thing I wanted to point out is that um, I've mentioned the research of Sarah Jamie Lewis uh, in the past couple of months. She did that uh, audit of um, the Swiss e-voting system, and uh, I, I was able to see one of her presentations that she gave. Um, if, you, if you didn't, you could actually watch uh, one of the recordings. They're available now online. And it was just so amazing because um, I wasn't aware that the Swiss Post had actually offered $150,000 in bounties to, like, publicly for people to find vulnerabilities in their system. And even with all of the publicity and effort that Sarah and her team got for what they did, um, they only got paid out, um, let's see, it was, it was 5,000 francs in total, and I think she and Open Privacy got half of that, so 2,500 francs, which is absolutely terrible. Um, and I don't know if they're ever going to rectify that situation, but uh, she just tweeted today that because of the fact that she's been speaking in uh, Switzerland, um, Switzerland is now approaching the number one source of donations because of all the people who attended those talks, so that's really cool. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, yeah, uh, I guess you know. All right, all right, I I got caught. I was I was I was still having that side channel conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess my final thought for the day is uh, fuck the Chinese government. Um, and uh, keep your eyes peeled for some new shy two fifty sixes in the next couple of days. Uh, after that debate uh, that, that me and Peter McCormick did uh, with Hotep Jesus and the BSV Tards, uh, I think I'm going to start trying to split my time on Shy 256 stuff between going into super nerd out shit that my head comes up with and trying to go through more newbie concepts that I see new people having trouble wrap their head around and I, i'd really appreciate help um in trying to get those out there and eyes on them because i mean honestly it, it does no good if i make stuff like that and it's just the uh the normal punks watching it uh who already know all this stuff uh so keep an eye out for that and i guess uh no part you got anything left yes be like water be like water <laughs> Right, we'll I, I would also now. wait. I would like. <laughs> I would like to add to the fucks and say, "Fuck the U.S. government, fuck the U.K. government, fuck parts of the Swiss government, and fuck Zuckbucks." Goodbye. Here. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week, punks. Adios. Bye bye. <laughs> Let's hang it just on